Hello everybody, welcome to Fruitful Trees and I am so excited today because you've been asking for a long time and I've, I've, I've searched and I found somebody who's, uh, I call him an expert with breadfruit and he works for an organization, a nonprofit organization that's helping to get this here to South Florida and today we're at Hidden Acres Farms, it's a mango farm that I've been to many times before, an amazing farm in Fort Lauderdale and we're going to be talking about the breadfruit with Ken who's part of this organization. I'm learning a lot about it but the great thing and, and exciting news for everybody here especially in South Florida, uh, there is breadfruit available breadfruit trees that uh, Hidden Acres Farm is going to have for sale and has for sale and this is a tree that is a uh, one particular variety there's several different varieties this one is in his yard so uh, maybe you can uh, get some tips on growing it we'll give you some tips of it today but uh, Steve the owner of Hidden Acres Farms successfully is growing two breadfruit trees here in South Florida and Ken who I'm going to be interviewing today is a big tree that's fruiting already. So it's just a great information about breadfruit. If you are interested in growing breadfruit, learning about breadfruit and everything, this is the video you want to see. Please share it with others if they live in the Caribbean or other islands around the world because breadfruit is such an important fruit from a nutritional standpoint. Uh, and also just uh, a great tree to have if you love collecting fruit trees. So check out this video. I'm gonna put the link to Hidden Acres Farm where you can get uh, the, the, you can get the breadfruit tree here in the United States in South Florida. Or I'm gonna also put the link to a nonprofit organization to Ken, who's gonna be talking today all about the history of the breadfruit and this great organization that's helping to grow these trees to feed people that need them around the world. So thanks for watching and here it goes. Hello everybody, here we are at Hidden Acres Farms with uh, Steve and this amazing mango farm. And this is Ken Banks and we're gonna to talk today about a topic I know many people you've been asking for. So uh, welcome, thanks Steve for having us come on out to the farm. Uh, we're gonna to talk to you about uh, uh, these trees that you have, these are breadfruit, everybody. Amazing trees. And a lot of people are asking me about bre breadfruit. And Ken contacted me, and Ken is a, a volunteer of an amazing organization, a nonprofit organization that works uh, with promoting the sale and the growth of breadfruit around nations to provide food. So you're gonna talk about that today and then Steve's gonna talk about how you can get these breadfruit trees here in South Florida for your own yard and also support this amazing uh, topic we're talking about today. So Ken, welcome to the show. Thank you, Paul. So tell us a little about uh, what you contacted me about and what you're, what, why we're here today. Right, I'm with the Trees That Feed Foundation and we're a not-for-profit uh, located in the United States and we help people feed themselves in the tropics. Um, we focus mostly in the Caribbean, Central America, but now we're working in Africa as well. Uh, we provide fruit trees for people and mostly breadfruit because it has a, a fairly good nutritional profile compared to other fruit. Um, if you had to live on a breadfruit, you could, whereas you enjoy a mango, but you can't live on it. Um, so we started out providing trees to people in Haiti, Jamaica, and gradually that program expanded to other islands in the Caribbean and Africa and a few other places in South America uh, just to try to, to get more trees uh, in mostly poor areas, lower, lesser served communities. Um, the idea there is food sustainability. Produce your own food rather than bringing it in from out overseas like is normally done. Sure, so the organization is based in, uh, you said Haiti? Uh, our office is in Chicago. Chicago. Our founders, Mike and Mary McLaughlin, are from Jamaica originally, and they wanted to, you know, and as they went into retirement, their careers in the U.S., they wanted to give back to their homeland and also others that were in need of that kind of work. So, when so nutritionally, you're saying breadfruit is a, a pretty complete food. Breadfruit has a, a pretty good nutritional profile for a fruit. Um, it's treated as a starchy vegetable mostly in the islands and the South Pacific where it was developed. Um, but it does have more protein than most of the, uh, the, starchy, the starchy fruits and vegetables. And as a fruit, it has more protein than a lot of the other sweeter fruits. And 
the, the, the carbohydrates are very complex, so that they a little more healthful than just the simple carbs that a lot of. Now, are there seeds in the breadfruit? Breadfruit, occasionally, some varieties will have seeds. Um, the breadfruit was developed in the South Pacific from its origin in New Guinea, we believe. Uh, and as the Polynesians spread throughout uh, the South Pacific, they carried breadfruit with them and they selected the ones that they liked the best and those included seedless varieties. So the, what we have now uh, came in the New World, came from the South Pacific area originally and they generally don't have seeds, but occasionally you'll find a seed in one of them. There are seeded breadfruits and there's actually a very close relative called a bread nut that looks just like a breadfruit tree but it has big seeds that are boiled or roasted and eaten like a chestnut, I guess, in the north. So for uh, certain environments, that would provide even more nutrition, those trees with the nuts and seeds. Yeah, well. I don't really know the nutritional profile of seeded breadfruit, but it could. I know I have a small one in a pot at home, and um, it didn't like the cold last winter around Christmas, So, but I, it was a very young tree, so I don't know how they would do in the colder areas. Sure. Now, we're here here in South Florida, uh, Fort Lauderdale, and you have a breadfruit tree at your house. I do. I'm in uh, East Hollywood. I have a, a variety called Ma'afala from Samoa, and my tree is about 15 to 20 feet tall. Um, it produces generally very well. It's a beautiful tree. Uh, the Ma'afala is a very dense canopy tree, um, often called a dwarf, but it really isn't a dwarf. Um, but it's a very nice looking tree, but it produces fairly well. Normally, this time of year is my biggest crop in October and I get 30-ish fruit, but these are fruit in this size range. Um, this year it's a little off and I think it's because we had that little cold Christmas last year. How many times a year does it fruit? It's really dependent on the water availability, uh, the, the fruit production. They like water, breadfruit do. Imagine those big leaves, how much water they lose every day in the sun. So it takes a lot of water for a breadfruit tree. Uh, we have plenty in Florida. So in the dry season, we I don't get as much, but I'll have flowers all through the year. I just tend to get my biggest crop October-ish, and I guess that's they developed in the summer when we have our rains. But. Sure. And how common is uh, the breadfruit out here in South Florida? It's not common. It's becoming more common. Um, frankly, I think before the last five, six, ten years, you might have found one or two trees. There was one at Fairchild in, in a building. I think it's still there. Um, there were occasional people near the coast that had trees. But keep in mind that if you were here in the 70s and 80s, it was cold here. We had frost almost every winter, and breadfruit do not like cold. But now things are different. We do have cold nights, but generally the average temperatures are higher, and that's allowing breadfruit to spread out more. There were some in the Keys because it's not quite as cold, um, but now we're starting to see people plant them. And like I said, my tree is 15, 20 feet tall. And How old is your tree? Well, I put it in around 2000 and early 17 or 16. Um, it was probably my height. And then Hurricane Irma is coming along and I trimmed it back to a stick about three feet tall because I knew another tree was going to fall on it, which it did. And it survived that. And so from 17 till now it's grown to, and I pruned it once, so Sure. The six years old, roughly, but you know, with some pruning, and I try to keep it at the 15 to 20 foot range. Is South Florida the only place in the United States where it can be grown? Continentally, yes. And actually, just the coastal Southeast Florida, perhaps Southwest Florida. So, in a land, not too much. That's questionable. We're still finding out now because breadfruit's not that common here. Um, we don't know how far inland it will grow well. Um, I have a friend in Lauder Hill, which is a little further west, and he gets nice fruit production. Gets a little cold burn once in a while on his leaves. But Well, how far south? I know you say southeast, but how far south? What's the border? West Palm, Jupiter? Can you go higher oh, than that? Will Port St. Lucie be able to grow it? That's a good question. Um, West Palm, I know there are trees in West Palm. We don't know yet. As people start to plant them, we're going to find out more and more how far north they'll grow. And if the climate is going to continue 
if those cold snaps are going to be less and less, it could be further north. There's a scientific paper that came out last year. One of our board members was a scientist on that. She's a geneticist. And they're looking, they modeled climate change and they modeled the climate where breadfruit could thrive. And they're finding, based on the models, you know, several models, not just one, that potentially it's going to move northward. It's, it's ability to produce northward as time goes on. And from a growing standpoint, are there any diseases to the trees that are common? I have not seen any here. Um, <clears throat> I know when our partner in St. Croix, he's had a, a mango seed borer that has been getting in his trees, his breadfruit trees, eating the tips. Um, but they're seasonal, so he's living with them. He, he can't find a way of controlling them. He's organic. Uh, I have not seen anything here that bothers them so far, other than cold or being too dry and just not producing well. Sure. Now, when people are growing breadfruit, what's the traditional way they're going to harvest and eat them? Like, what uh, can they just eat it the way it is? There's a, there's a breadfruit right there behind. Steve, yes. Uh, uh, so that's one from the store. It doesn't look that great, but that's what you're no, looking at. No, I bought that this morning at the grocery store, and it, yeah, they didn't look very well. So they're kind of like a starchy banana, almost in terms of how you can use uh, plantain and almost how you can use them, right? Yeah, and so in the Caribbean, they eat a lot of starchy root vegetables. They, some islands they call it ground provisions, or where, where my stepmom was from is bread, bread kind. They call it. It includes plantains, uh, cassava, malanga dasheen, um, sweet potato, pumpkin, those kind of things, the starchy vegetables. And breadfruit is called, it's put in that group too, even though it's a fruit. So it's very starchy, um, but it does have a little more protein. So typically they pick them when they're full. The fruit is smoothed out. A young fruit will have a little spikes all over it. Um, sort of like a knicker bean if you know what that is maybe not that sharp but as it develops and fills out those spurs will smooth out and you'll get very small green scales on the surface and then you'll start to get darkening between those little scales and then latex will come out you may see white on that fruit that's latex like jackfruit, like jackfruit right and they are very closely related to jackfruit are they in the same family of jackfruit? they're in the same genus which is even oh, closer wow. than family wow. So when you get that full look to it and you get those little darkening, that little darkening around the segments and you get that latex, then it's a full fruit and it's barely gives to the touch. They don't keep very well. So if you let it go a couple days after that, it's going to get sweet and ripe and then it softens up and it's, it doesn't have the same usage as it does. Well, at that point, can you eat it raw? I have not tried it raw. I suspect you could. Um, I've only eaten it full, and I, when it gets ripe and sweet, I usually put it in a bread or in a pancake or in a pudding or something like that. So after three days of being picked, you said it gets... I don't say three days, but it depends on the temperature, but it does not keep very well. And that's been the reason you haven't seen them in grocery stores until recently. Just getting them from Caribbean to Florida, they don't keep. So um, the solution to that is to grow them in Florida, is one. But also in the Caribbean, they're starting to make products and processing them there and freezing it and then shipping that product. And I brought a couple today that you can look Do at. Do they ripen off the tree like bananas? They'll go very quickly, yes. So they will ripen. So if you pick them uh, a little unripe, they will ripen off but the tree. But when you say ripe, when I say ripe, I mean sweet and soft. Full is how we judge them typically as a food. And when it's ready to eat, it's full. Ripening is when they start. Well, what to I'm get saying sweet. is, groceries will pick. Like if you have a, your own banana tree, you wait till they turn yellow. But groceries will pick them way yellow, way green, and they'll ripen yellow in the store. Right. So they won't develop into a full state once you pick them. If okay. you pick them too early, they're not going to develop properly. Okay. And I suspect that one behind me is not picked properly. So it because they're traveling probably because most they're traveling. Are. That's right. That's right. Um, but if you're not eating it, like to look at eat it raw, it don't matter too much because you're still, if it's fully processed or not, or does it still matter? That's right. I mean, I'm not a raw food person, and, um, I, so I don't really know ways of preparing things. I suspect you could eat it full if you just prepared it properly. If you could eat a potato raw, then you could probably eat a breadfruit raw. Sure, sure. 
And what, tell us a little about the different varieties of it. What's the most common ones? And well, there are a lot of varieties in the South Pacific. So as each, this, these Polynesian voyagers carried these to other islands and then they selected more and more. So there are quite a few varieties. The most popular, we generally divide them up into white breadfruit and yellow breadfruit in the Caribbean. The white breadfruit tend to be very starchy. They're large and they're, you, they're better for flour and that kind of thing. They're not as flavorful. The yellow breadfruit have a better eating texture. They're, they're more creamy at times, more flavorful. They're better for eating, um, you know, in a meal or something. The most popular variety in the Caribbean, well, certainly in Jamaica, is called yellow heart. It's one of the yellow varieties. And it's, it's very popular here because of all the Jamaican folks that live here now, and they always ask for yellow heart. Uh, there's another one that we really like uh, from Samoa called Maafala, and that's what I have in my yard. It's a little smaller fruit, but it's very flavorful. It has a little more protein uh, than some of the other varieties. And it's, it's a very nice fruit. It's ideal for the yard because it tends to stay compact and it's easy, more easily managed. I was going to ask you, how tall do they normally grow? A breadfruit can get very, very large if you let it. So this one you're telling us about this variety is a more dwarf variety? They call it a dwarf, but it will get large if you don't manage it. Just like a dwarf mango isn't a dwarf unless sure. you manage it to be a dwarf. But, but it grows much slower. So It grows slower and it's, it fruits better, it's small, you know, so it, they call it a dwarf. So Malafala is in that same kind of uh, category, but it really is very, very good quality, taste-wise, very flavorful. I really like the Malafala. I think um, we also have here now Otia. Um, at, at Hidden Acres. Uh, Three gallon Otias. And that is a larger, uh, lighter colored, creamy fruit. I have not tasted it. Uh, it's become very popular in Hawaii, I think. And uh, we've gotten some from them, but we I really don't know. I can't comment on the flavor. Myself. So when somebody goes to Hawaii or the Caribbean and they're eating breadfruit, it's usually in the form of a flour or a, or a meal or something. They're not just eating a breadfruit. If you're going to the Caribbean and in, in, in a local restaurant, you're probably getting it boiled or uh, roasted. And a lot of times they'll throw the whole fruit in the fire and let it roast. It turns black, they peel off the black skin and it's very soft and creamy inside. Um, so you're probably getting it that way or boiled in some kind of a soup or a, a curry or something. Um, wow. It's not likely that you're getting it in the sweet ripe stage. In Hawaii, they make, um, they ferment it and they make, poi I guess is made from dashin or taro, but I think they'll make poi out of breadfruit too. But they do other things with it in Polynesia uh, in addition. And the nonprofit organization that you're part of that's discussing this, their goal is to get people in areas where it's hard to get food to grow the breadfruit so they can use it for nutrition. That's right. We want people to, to feed themselves rather than rely on imports from other countries. Um, they're sending their, their hard-earned dollars to go out of the country when they buy from overseas, and that's what they do. Um, but here's a plant they can grow easily. It produces very well, very few problems. It can provide a family with all the breadfruit they ever need in a year. So it makes sense to grow them more. And then if they can, because it doesn't preserve well, it's hard to go to market with it. But if we um, come up with other ways to treat it, like the flour, for example, or they make porridges out of it. Um, some One of our partners is making fried breadfruit chunks frozen and packaging them and selling them. Uh, and they're available here now, public sells them. Can you freeze the, uh, the breadfruit? The breadfruit itself raw does not freeze well, okay. but if you steam it or you roast it or you bake it, then you can freeze it and it'll keep very well. So uh, I'm going to put your, the nonprofit uh, uh, ministry address or the nonprofit corporation below in the video in the description so everyone can get there. But tell us the name of it again. It's the Trees That Feed Foundation. And besides the breadfruit, do they, they deal with other? Oh, yes. Uh, we talk a lot about breadfruit, but we, we send mango. We send new mango varieties to other islands. Uh, I took some, uh, Rich, Dr. Richard Campbell years ago at, when he was at Fairchild, gave me a number of uh, mango scions to carry to, to Haiti. We're trying to expand their fruiting season. I was down there years ago at an orphanage 
we had a partner and there was a little girl she was probably three years old totally blind her eyes were all white opaque and sweet little girl and I found out later she was blind because she didn't have vitamin A in her diet vitamin A <laughs> if she had had that she would have had her sight wow. and mangoes have some vitamin A and a number of other things if you know mango season is only so long but if you have a longer season or if you dehydrate mangoes or something like that with vitamin A sure. those kids won't be blind anymore wow. and so it really affected me a lot and I I wanted to, that's really got me engaged with the Trees That Feed Foundation, but um, we have sent a number of mango varieties to Haiti. Barbados now has maybe 50 or plus varieties of mango they didn't have before that we have helped. Uh, you know, I take them down there and propagate. Steve donates those. And uh, we have a great partner in Barbados who has been um, promoting that as well. Um, we just sent a a, a load of trees to Montserrat. They were almost destroyed by a volcano a number of years ago, and they're trying to re-establish their, their agriculture. So uh, we sent avocados and some other things. Um, we got it from Pine Island Nursery down in Homestead, sure. and then just shipped it uh, to uh, It's very Montserrat. interesting. I hear some place in the Caribbean, some islands, which are great environments to grow fruit. They just don't grow as much fruit. It's really interesting. I think the I think I heard years ago the Bahamas they don't have many fruit trees. That's a good point, and you're right. Um, certainly, the kinds of growing conditions are challenging in some islands. The Bahamas are pure limestone. Water is either pouring down rain or there's nothing. Uh, there's limited freshwater resources, so it's challenging to grow a lot of things. But I'm glad you mentioned the Bahamas because we've just done a lot with them in the last couple of years. Uh, the Prime Minister's wife, um, Lady Ann Davis, had a big project with us last uh, year where we shipped breadfruit trees in. Um, we're helping a couple of farmers who were destroyed by Hurricane Dorian reestablish their crops um, in, in Grand Bahama. That's work happening right now. Uh, yeah, we've shipped a number of breadfruit trees into Abaco, Grand Bahama, Nassau, we have some great partners there now that are really trying to promote um, growing more crops that you just mentioned. Sure. Now, in the United States, even though we have a good food supply, it would seem that people are trying to live self-sufficient mm -hmm. that are in South Florida, or at least, where the breadfruit tree grows. This would be an essential tree to have. This would be a great tree to have if you're in the right uh, climate. Yeah. Um, like I said, it's got a good nutritional profile. Yeah. I really enjoy eating it. It's a starchy fruit, but it does have a flavor, and I really like it. Um, you know, my wife and I, my daughter, we eat it every time we eat everything we grow. Um, it goes in stews. I love it fried. I've made cakes with it, um, breads with it. Uh, it makes a great porridge, which is a very popular breakfast item in the Caribbean, you know, like a, like oatmeal. Um, well, and, yeah, and a mafala tree could fit in a not too big a yard and be managed pretty well. Well, I, I want to see some of the products, but before we do that, if you could hand the mic over to Steve, because I want to ask him about the trees he has available, and then we'll look at your products. Okay. All right. Uh, so uh, Steve's here at Hidden Acres, and I'll put the address in below. Uh, they have an amazing mango farm. They have uh, such an amazing amount of varieties in the summer and other fruit as well. But they sell trees here, and here are some breadfruit trees. <laughs> so have you always sold breadfruit trees, or is it when you met Ken that you started? Didn't know much about them until Ken came and was volunteering for us doing uh, grafting. I think we actually first met down the year I had a mango booth at uh, Fairchild, and he was there promoting the dehydrators for trees that feed. We kind of connected on that and started talking about different what they were doing. I like their idea of their uh, the nonprofit is to um, help people not need help. They can grow their own food gives them the dignity of not needing someone to come in and help them and they can you know and then actually take that into the community and sell what they grow if they have surplus so we started talking about that mary was really generous about um they donated the first group of trees that we did what that's a year and a half ago maybe um those are all mafalas um we sold a lot of those here locally in one gallon and three gallon trees um the only mafalas we have left now are either seven gallons or 15 gallons they're older trees that we've been growing for a while um, we also got just a few Otias that Ken grew, 
we have a small crop of yellow heart, which is always, anyone seem to be from the islands, they normally ask for yellow heart. That's the one they know, it's a bigger one. Um, so we have some one gallons of those, pr pretty limited, but we do have maybe 300 small trees coming in, hopefully within a week or so. Those would probably be ready for sale after the first of the year, depending on the weather. Um, we gotta make it through the winter. So um, it was just an idea we tried. Um, I, I was lucky enough to visit Hawaii once and a tree that caught my eye, not because it fruited, but just the beautiful shape of the tree and that big leaf. When they're 15 to 20 feet tall and 15 feet wide with that leaf, it, it really stands out. If you didn't get a fruit on it, it's a nice tree for your yard. Yeah, so are these seeded trees or grafted trees that you, you have? They're actually uh, tissue culture trees, which is something really new on the market. Um, uh, trees that feed people uh, I guess we got together with someone, that was the breadfruit expert, that figured out a way to uh, tissue culture them like they do a lot of other plants now. Is that like different than air layering tissue culturing? Yeah, you're basically just, I mean, Ken can probably explain to you more, they're just basically taking cells, um, small pieces from a plant, and then reproducing it in a test tube, and then growing it out. Really? Wow. Yeah. It's, wow. It, it's common with a lot of ornamental plants. Can you do that with uh, like mangoes and other fruits, or is that the future, or you don't I know? I know they do, what, in California, they they do almonds and pistachios or stuff like that, I think. Um, just the way you, get, you can get, when you find something that works, you can get a lot of volume from a small amount of tissue. Well, you said, you were saying, you know, can they, or they just don't? Uh, generally, tree fruit trees don't tissue culture well, with many exceptions. Um, and a company in California commercially produces almonds and pistachios or whatever they grow out there. and they decided to produce some breadfruits just to try to help people, and they work through us, you know, get some of these on the market. So breadfruit apparently cultures quite easily. Wow, so these trees that you're having, the 300 trees you're getting for sale, and some of these trees, they're from tissue culture, not, mm -hmm. I mean, do you need a seedling to start the tissue culture, or did they just start from the beginning in a laboratory? No, breadfruit are typically propagated vegetatively, not by seed because they don't have seeds. So when you, you you either get a root sucker comes up, which I do at home all the time, uh, you can air layer it where you cut a ring of bark away sure. and mo put moss around it, you know, for a few months, couple months, and produce roots. And sometimes you can do uh, stem cuttings if you're careful, but it's generally propagated that way. Oh, a big way too is root, pieces of root that are put, laid down in a bed of sand or something and they will send up suckers over time. Okay. That's a common way of it. So like Moringa, similar to that. Sure. Yeah. Um, and they, and it, it, it takes quite a while for root cuttings. Uh, probably the quickest way besides tissue culture is um, air layer, and that's pretty quick that way, but uh, okay. it's, it's labor. -intensive. I mean, can you graft these trees as well, or is yes, just something that's Yes, they can be grafted, and there are some folks doing that in Central America with a patch bud. Um, so folks in Africa did it, and they they took, but they didn't. They died. At some sure. Point. So it's we're still learning how to graph. Uh, okay. So Steve, so you have these available right now. These few, few, but you're getting 300, and should be ready by the beginning of the year if they work out okay. Yeah, depending on how the how the winter works out. Um, and we did add an interesting note about winter time. Was it? Uh, Last year, we had some mafalas in three gallons, and Ken brought over a temperature probe, and we had um, two nights at what thirty-nine or forty, which could be, and in you know some cases that can hurt them. But um, we're pretty far east, probably six miles from the coast, and they survived fine. They never dropped a leaf from the thirty-nine or forty for two nights. I think that was that was winter before last last winter was a little we had more longer stretch of cold nights um so my trees did lose some leaves but i didn't have any stem damage maybe a little bit of leaf damage um i think they're probably my guess is similar to a mango in that the older the tree is more mature it is it's not going to get hurt as bad as sure. a, a young tree you know just planted in the ground so but there's still there's people everywhere down here testing limits on you know where they'll work we're still finding out about how that's going to work out so it's fast growing tree too yeah, uh, I, once it once it get established well, i know you have a tree in the ground two trees right yourself yeah i got one mile follow that we put in my mom's yard and we have a yellow heart that can get me we believe it's a yellow heart uh, back in the corner that one's up about what 10 11 feet now it should be uh, how old are those trees when did you put those in the ground 
Uh, the mafala came from, it's one of the crop that we did from tissue culture. It's probably about, it'll be three years old this spring. Um, it sat in a container for a long time before we decided to put one in the ground. Um, and then the, I'm not sure how old the yellow heart is. It seems to grow a bit faster. It's stretching up tall. It's probably a year and a half. <laughs> it's not real. Yeah. yeah so, so these seven trees right here, even though you're going to have hundreds in the next summer or, or in the spring, but these seven trees, are these currently for sale? Yeah, we've got a few more than that. These are just some representatives. Okay, so, I've got, so I've got if a somebody few more called sevens. you, they see this video, they're excited, they're in South Florida, they can contact Hidden Acres yeah. and, and get yeah. a tree. Yep. Wow. And now how long should they put them in the ground right away or they can keep them in the pot? Will they grow long in the pot? Uh, they, I mean, depend on the size of the pot. I, I would say if you're buying them right now, going into winter, probably be a good idea to keep them in a in a pot in case we get a real hard freeze, which doesn't happen very often. You could bring it into the garage and protect it, and then put them in the ground in the spring, and give them that year of you know uh, uh, growth before they get face another winter. Um, depending on where you're at, if you're on the coast in Fort Lauderdale, it probably doesn't matter. Um, if you're in Wellington, you probably want to protect them. So now, in general, can you do you think you can grow them in a pot and get fruit, or that's a stretch? I don't know. <laughs> well, our, our founder grows in Chicago, has a breadfruit tree in his house. He's grown for years and he propagates it by air layering. But I don't think he's ever had a fruit. I'd have to check with him, but I don't think he has. Yeah, it. probably wow. get stimulated so right short <laughs> in winter. So that's yeah. yeah. Wow. That's really yeah. amazing. All right, everybody. Well, if you want to get breadfruit, this is the place. So if you want to give him back the microphone, and we'll keep you on your talk. products here too. So we're going to look a little about what you can do with the breadfruit, uh, with the get... products of the actual breadfruit. All right. So Steve was just showing us these uh, processed buns that it's a are comparette. A comparette. So called. in southern Haiti, it's a very popular food item. It's very heavy and tends to be dry, but it fills you up well. So yeah, it, it's, it's nice really for that. Good. They have a good flavor. They're great flavor. They have ginger in them and coconut and little orange rind. And and here's um, the, the main thing, the breadfruit flour, straight up breadfruit. And this is this from the organization, a nonprofit? Yeah, we brought in a bunch of flour a few years ago and, and bagged it up, trying to promote it in this country. Um, here's a pancake mix that someone produced. I'm not sure where it came from, but... Uh, apparently that's available now in in the states. Uh, Denver, Colorado. I'm looking on the back. Okay. I imported it. Uh, we have a partner, and she lives here. She's from Puerto Rico. She lives in Weston, I believe, and she's been importing frozen breadfruit. Um, tostones. If you like Cuban food, you know tostones. They're made from green plantain. Uh, they're fried, mashed, and fried again. They're they're very good. Breadfruit tostones to me are far better. <laughs> um, they are they have a nice crispy outside and they're very creamy and rich inside with that nice flavor and they're really really good. So these are now available. I think I got this at Publix. So oh wow, I'm not sure how all the Publixes have them, but they're 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 available here now. Breadfruit makes a great substitute for French fries. It does. And when Pierre was here, and here's the French fry. <laughs> oh wow! Cut them, cut them thin and fried them. They're really, really good. I was, I was pretty surprised. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure who these guys are, and I'm glad they're doing what they're doing. They're making a frozen French fry. So when you process these things, you can. It's easier to bring them in from inspection requirements with FDA. It's also they preserve well because they're frozen, so they keep basically, I guess, forever. I don't know. Um, well, fresh fruit is a little more challenging, and that's why it's nice that they're producing products. You know, sure. That'll so, keep if somebody it. gets familiar with how to process, grow, and process the breadfruit, this is the food you're talking about. They can grow this, freeze this, store the flour, and have food for their whole family for the whole year. Yes. Yeah, so what I do at home is I take my breadfruit. I like it roasted, like the Jamaicans. I I have a charcoal grill, I don't use gas. So I just throw it in there and let it roast for a couple of hours until it gets soft. I cut a little X in the end of it so it lets the steam out and doesn't open up. And when it cools down, you can peel it real easily by hand and take the core out and get rid of the core. And you can freeze it and it's good for whatever, a long time. So when you don't have fruit, you have them. And when you do have bread fruit, you have a lot. So, you know, it's like mangoes in that way. So you can freeze it after you steam it or, or roast it or even my Jamaican friend says he puts them in the microwave. And <laughs> so I guess you could cook them in the microwave, the whole thing. Sure. But now, when somebody buys a, a breadfruit tree here from Hidden Acres, does any of that go towards your 
uh, the nonprofit? Well, it, it benefits us in a few ways. Uh, our first load of fruit uh, trees, Steve was giving us half of his proceeds from those trees. So he really wasn't making any money on them. He was helping us more than anything. Um, and as time went on, he became started donating other things to us space time mango scions uh, trees occasionally you know so we just now have this partnering sort of relationship where we need something steve's always there to help us out uh, so it's kind of a, a team effort in that way regarding the breadfruit gaia gaia this is such an important thing and hopefully more people in south florida will get it great so I'm going to put the address uh, to uh, Hidden Acres Farms and also to your uh, yeah, I can give you a profit below in the description here. And, the, yeah. I don't think there's an address on it, but they work out of their home, so they don't. Yeah, I'll put it all below the website, and we're on Facebook and Instagram and all that junk. Yeah, great. You'll send that to me, and I'll put that. You all can have below. that if you want. Oh, great, thank. Well, anything else e either one of you want to say? Um, we probably ought to talk about how to plant and so if someone buys a tree, sure. what do they do next? Okay, so if somebody gets this tree, how would they, uh, what's the best way to plant it? So if you're in a smaller tree, I, Steve already mentioned this somewhat, uh, the smaller one gallon are probably not ready to go on the ground yet. Uh, I'd probably take them up to three gallon or bigger size, but make sure they have a good root system. Plant them like you would any fruit tree, not too deep. Um, but at the soil surface. And then make sure the key element for success is water. While they're getting established in the ground, they've got to have water every day if it's not raining. Because again, those giant leaves pump a lot of water out, and especially if they're in the sun. Water it anyway, even if it is raining. Water it anyway, even if it's raining. The, the biggest loss is people plant a tree and walk up, especially a breadfruit, and they walk away and it's dead in a, in a few weeks because they didn't water it. Once it starts to grow and get this root system and get over the stress of, of, of planting, it's pretty good. You don't have to water it all the time. And once it gets up, you know, like a seven gallon size in the ground, it'll take care of itself for the most part. In the dry season, I, I water mine with a sprinkler system just because I want to get more fruit and they tend to produce better when they're watered well. But after they're established and older, they can tolerate some dry periods. They just won't produce as well. They're also somewhat salt tolerant, which is surprising. Um, there's a, a farm in the Keys at Grimmel Groves. He's growing breadfruit now, Patrick uh, Garvey, and he's uh, found that they're quite resistant to the salt down in the Keys, as well as that high pH, you know, limestone in the Keys. We're, our pH is very high here, too, and the breadfruit in my home is also high pH, and we have no problems. We don't show any signs of nutrient deficiency in the, in the trees. So it's very well adapted to different soils and different um, conditions once it's established in the ground. What about uh, uh, pesticides or anything like that? Did it I don't, do well? I don't use any. I haven't had a need. I've had no pest problems. Uh, I will feed it once in a while with a palm type fertilizer, A212 or something like that. It doesn't show any deficiencies. I just feel like I'll do it. Just, you know. Push a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, you can push them in their growth rates a little bit with a little fertilizer. In your opinion, if somebody was going to plant this, how far would you suggest they plant it away from other trees? A mile of fall, it depends on how hard you like to work in your yard, just like a mango tree. If you plant a, I'll call it a dwarf mango, which we said is not a true dwarf, but you plant it to where you're willing to prune it to, so that distance away. If you want to, if you're willing to prune these every year or every couple, I, I prune mine. I pruned it once in several years. But if you're willing to prune occasionally, you can get a little closer. But I would give it to farmers. We recommend a good 25, 30 foot spacing because they have a big canopy. They do shed a lot of leaves, so you're going to have a lot of leaves on the ground. Some people like a nice manicured lawn, and that's okay. But know that they're going to drop a lot of leaves big if leaves. that's big leaves, right? Wonderful. And the leaves are sort of like Velcro, <laughs> or is it Vel yeah, Velcro, they're, they're sort of sticky and they'll stick on your clothes if you want. Are the leaves edible? No, I, they're, they're sort of like a cat's tongue in texture. They're that sticky, I would not eat it. 
Cooked. Well, not raw, but even if they're cooked, they're not edible. I, they're very starchy, uh, very latexy trees, so I doubt it. Okay, but I've never heard of anyone eating them. I know there's uh, this, the native Polynesians have a number of uses for the breadfruit tree. The latex is used to caulk their canoes when they used to make canoes. The bark is pounded out to make cloth and fiber. Um, a lot of medicinal uses they have, as well as the you know the edibility of the fruit. So that, you know there's a lot of traditional uses of the breadfruit. Great. Well, thank you very much for having us uh, get together and sharing all about this. And everybody grab a breadfruit tree here from Hidden Acres Mango Farm. I'll put their information below. So them. here we're in Steve's yard and this is a, one of his two breadfruit that he has in the ground. This one's called the Manfala variety. And how long has this been in the ground? We put it in the ground about a year ago. Um, a year earlier than that it was uh, one gallon. So it's probably about three years old from tissue culture. Okay. Wow. And how long before that'll get fruit on it? That tree could fruit any time. We've had them fruit from, from tissue culture uh, in two and a half years in some of the Caribbean islands, but it's never cold there. So given our cold, it, it could fruit any, it could fruit next year. We're I, hoping next year or the year after that would be and, ideal. Okay. And there are two types of flowers. There's a male flower, as the Jamaicans call it a sword. Um, and then the female flower is a rounder flower and it becomes the fruit. They don't sexually cross. So the male flower just falls off. But they have found it has, it keeps mosquitoes away when they burn it. So we take a dried male flower and light it and it'll burn and smolder and it keeps mosquitoes away. Great question, important question. Do you need two trees to produce fruit? You do not because they don't, they're not, they don't use sexual reproduction. The Polynesians selected that away. So you only need one tree and you're gonna get fruit, any tree. There's no difference. Where's the breadfruit native from, and and how to get here? Well, you'll get a free, you'll get a little flower that comes out near the terminal bud, the end bud. Where's it native from? No, oh, the I'm native sorry. Well, yeah, what country? Uh, it, well, the, the breadfruit tree is believed it originated in New Guinea. Naturally, it was a very seedy, small, lumpy fruit. They think um, people started moving it. And as people migrated into the South Pacific, um, they brought breadfruit with them. And the oldest records, I think, are in Samoa, back 3,000 years. So as they voyaged throughout the Pacific, the Polynesians, and colonized the Pacific, they selected their favorite fruit trees and brought them with them. So that's how they spread around the Pacific and how the different varieties developed. And ultimately, they got most of the, most of the varieties became seedless, with some exceptions. Um, how it got to the New World is an interesting story. Um, if you're my age, you'll remember uh, the story, the mutiny on the bounty. Um, so there was a naturalist, a very wealthy one in England in the 1700s, Sir Joseph Banks, no relative of mine, that was convinced that breadfruit could feed people in the Caribbean. And his intent was to feed slaves in the Caribbean um, because a tree is productive and it produced well. So uh, they sent a Captain William Bly and his crew to the South Pacific from England to get breadfruit trees and bring them back to the Caribbean. Uh, they went to Tahiti. Uh, the guys, the, soul, the sailors liked Tahiti a lot and didn't really want to leave. Um, and some other issues came up, whatever they are historically. And there was a mutiny after they left Tahiti. And Captain Bly was put with a few of his loyal sailors in a lifeboat and sailed. They knew he wouldn't survive that, but he managed to succeed and sailed all the way to Australia in a lifeboat. And only lost one man, and that's to natives when they tried to get water on an island. And the mutineers took the bounty and went to Pitcairn Island to get away and settled it. So Bly made it back to England and they sent him again, go get some of those breadfruit trees. And they did. And he succeeded this time and brought the first ones to an island called St. Vincent down in the Grenadines and then some to Jamaica. And they started spreading from there and they did quite well. So it's kind of an interesting story on how breadfruit got to the new world. Who named it breadfruit? That's a good question. Different languages have different names. Puerto Ricans call it pana. Um, and the uh, Fui de Pan, I think, in the French islands. So they felt like the breadfruit, when you roasted it, had a bread-like 
character. I don't think it does, but th that's, that's where the name came from. So around the world, that's the most common name, breadfruit. In the English world, but in the other languages, they have different names for it. Okay. Now, you say it's related to the jackfruit. Uh, so... Are there other fruits that are similar to the breadfruit? Yeah, there's well, there's a number of relatives. It's, the genus is called Artocarpus. Jackfruit is the same genus, so Champadec. There's a number of fruits in the Indonesian area that are all in that genus. Quaimunk, Quaimunk. Yeah, I'm not familiar with yeah, that one, okay. but yeah. there's a number of them, and uh, they all have different flavors. Breadfruit was taken out of that area a few thousand years ago into the Pacific, so it I'll say it evolved differently because of people and the way they moved it around and selected it. Very, very nice. And what's that book you have there? This yeah, is here's a very interesting book that was written by, he was from Jamaica originally, and he, um, he went to high school, I believe, with our founders, Mike and Mary McLaughlin. And he was a historian and put together these historical stories about breadfruit. And uh, Trees of Feet published it a, a year or so ago. Uh, he recently passed away, unfortunately. But it's a fascinating book. I believe it's available on Amazon. But if you're into history and into horticulture and, and like that kind of thing, you'll find it, some really good stories in here on, on breadfruit. And his name is uh, Michael... Oh, sorry, I'm covering that up. Morrissey. Michael Morrissey. Okay. And there's a lot of pictures in there. It's a good book. A lot of history. Yeah, it's a fascinating book if you, if you like that kind of thing. All right. All right, everybody, there it was, breadfruit. How many of you here in South Florida are growing breadfruit? Put that below in the comments. Let me know, and I'd love to come check out your tree and uh, hear your story about it. Uh, breadfruit is not easy to grow if you're a little north, maybe in a cooler environment or inland. It's susceptible if it's going to grow well, but it can successfully grow here in Southeast Florida. People are doing it. If you're one of them, let me know. Or if you have any other trees and you want me to come film you, let me know. I'd love to come on out. Uh, but this is breadfruit, a wonderful tree, a wonderful uh, fruit, and great information. So thank you, Ken, and thank you, Steve, for having us come out and, and checking this out, this information. Until then, everybody, have a great day and keep growing.